Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World India's first Future Tech Meet Sustainability podcast and today I'm delighted and on to have with me Lu Zhang the founder and managing partner of Fusion Fund. She is an investor, serial entrepreneur and Stanford engineering alumna. Lu really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Why don't we start with a small brief introduction? Yeah, happy to you kind of cover my background already. So, uh my uh journey has been very fascinating since I landed in Silicon Valley. So my first 20 years I grew up in Inner Mongolia. For many of you probably never been to my hometown but the Mongolia is a very very beautiful uh place and I came to United States with no idea about entrepreneurship or technology innovation but I was very lucky uh landed in Silicon Valley went to Stanford University for my PhD uh graduate school research so I was in material science engineering department I was a really hardcore engineer and my major focus was really leverage the technology leverage the research to find out the best solution for different domain for sensor technology multi junction solar cell this some um, battery lots of things you heard today we've been doing that uh, like fundamental material innovation back in like 10 years ago and the one of my patent technology it was a biomedical sensor had the application for diagnostic of type 2 diabetes i right now it's a huge huge market same for united states and my technology was quite unique so at age of 21 i became a solo founder solo founder start my and run my company supported by Stanford by Silicon Valley by the investor locally and the graduate from school and later uh, eventually sold my company to Boston Scientific one of the largest uh, public listed medical device company in United States so when I sold my company my ownership was 72% which means I control company and also I got the majority of the financial return so when I got that I got my second transition point The first was from a researcher mature scientist to a entrepreneur and after that I became an investor. I used my own personal money invest a bunch of a great founder from the focus on deep tech healthcare immigrant founder. So so far we have in total close to 400 million dollar under management and we're marching to half a billion dollar target by the end of this year. We have a um, four flex four fund under management and uh, already built up a strong track record. But I still consider us as a startup in the VC industry. We've been doing lots of innovation since the day one and that also were like a newcomer in the VC industry but was able to really build up our track record focus and bring something new to this uh, industry. Thank you for sharing your story Lu and that's such an awesome and inspirational uh, story you know you so you saying you, you've come from a small country like Mongolia uh, being a minority uh, women tech founder set up base in America uh, started a biotech firm scaled it uh, and eventually sold it and retained the largest share and then uh, took that for the, the the funds and invested in your own VC firm which right now has a huge huge capital in you backing some of the top uh, deep tech startup how inspirational is that i'm sure the listeners uh, will, will take this that any today today i think anything and everything is possible if you put your mind and heart into it uh, can you talk about your company your, your first company aston inc and, and this wearable device that you created for type 2 type 2 diabetes and maybe the transition from being an entrepreneur to setting up this vc firm yes you know uh Entrepreneur journey is really a great rewarding process for me but also as a solo and solo founder I was a I sometimes joke about was a miserable life experience because it just uh, so many challenges and uh, so many things you have to figure out another thing is I was young and inexperienced so I'm new to this industry I have to learn everything from scratch but when I look back I think lots of a great learning including lots of thing I kind of decided to do eventually become the resources and the benefit for me today as an investor for them parts I mentioned I was able to maintain high ownership of my company people thought oh Lou you are so smart I'm like because I had no choice I didn't have the uh, privilege to raise 100 millions from all this VC because back in the days 10 years ago Silicon Valley VC firm did not like Healthcare they didn't like hard tech or hardware. Now to mention, I was a female minority young founder, kind of uncheck out the box for them. But the learning and the benefit was, I have to run the company pretty lean, and based on the limited resources and capital I had to build a sustainable business model, generating revenue and market validation early on. So that's a great learning for me. That's also become great resources I could share and support the founder I work with right now. 
they raise money early stage and how to maintain the ownership of the company, not to raise too much, but just raise barely enough capital to really build a strong business and the take from they're generating solid revenue. So looking back, I think this is a really good journey to transition from entrepreneur to investor. The, I had the experience to be on the both side of the table. And uh, when I started uh, Fusion Fund, I really started as my another startup. The way I run a firm, the type of company, the type of uh, you know, partners I attract and the people I recruit in the firm were all from entrepreneur or a group of technologists. So we really have passion for early stage company. Then we become such a great partner to the founder we invested. So okay. going back to looking back, like uh, the exit was good. I think that's also a really good transition for me, start to use my personal capital to back other founder, give a try and also be able to practice my own investment methodology and which eventually contribute to methodology of our investment systems institution fund. Uh, how has the ecosystem been? Because you said you, you are you are an outsider, a minority who fought, fought against the system and you were pushed. And so that's the reason you did what's the best and you uh, and you, you created a company, exited out of it. And now you've created, uh, I mean, your own fusion fund. So so, so talk talk to me about the, this journey. I mean, how has the ecosystem been for somebody who's an outsider? Was it welcoming? I would say... Uh... You know, definitely there, is, there was a stereotyping, even discrimination occur. And but the ecosystem is getting better and better. Another thing is the Silicon Valley as a very unique ecosystem in the United States, or even the, for the whole world, we probably have the highest percentage of the local resident was a first as a first generation immigrant. So I think, yes, there are challenges. But the good thing is, I think people here are more willing to change their stereotype if they realize, oh, I was wrong. So that's the thing I was doing that, yes, there's lots of challenge when I was a founder, but because of, you know, Mongolian personality, I just uh, like to fight against the challenge, find them battle, prove them wrong. And later I also be able to convert lots of people who challenge me at the first become a close business partner. But still, you know, even I was able to fight a battle, there are lots of people who was not able to. That's my one of my motivation. I want to start a VC firm. I was told when I started VC, uh, my own VC firm, they're like, never have a people like you with your background ever start a VC firm. And first generation immigrant, minority female, only 25 years old. I'm like, that's great. I like to be the first one when I'm doing something new. So it's nice to be the first one. So when I start doing this, I think also start to observing the change and evolving of the ecosystem. Another thing I think is also relate back to who are the major driving force in the tech industry and also in the entrepreneur uh, community. Last round of the innovation was more focused on business model innovation consumer. But since a couple of years ago, the true trend going on was deep tech and healthcare and fundamental technology innovation and the technology application innovation. Even recently, we're talking about, okay, look at the loss of this amazing unicorn company right now in Silicon Valley and United States. More than 50% of them, founder has immigrant background. Now the buzzword is artificial intelligence. Then look at majority of the paper in AI. Uh, most of this key player in the AI industry, they're actually either immigrant or Asian American. So there are lots of changing happening in the tech industry, which also drive the change in the entrepreneur and eventually going to bring changes to the VC ecosystem. So I'm very happy to be part of this evolving change and also be one of the people to drive the change happening in the ecosystem. Uh, Lou, more power to you, and you rightfully pointed out, I, I think the world is changing. I think just a couple of years back, uh, everything was monopolized. I mean, it was always maybe the West, you know, from where all the the, the, the greatest in innovations were coming out. But I think that's that's shifting, and, and there are there's, there's, there's countries like Mongolia, uh, India, Bangladesh, and Africa, and, and we, you know, these unknown places from where I think the innovations are coming out. And I think largely that's happening because of the democratization knowledge today i think anybody and anyone with the power of possibly as simple as maybe like a, a phone has got access to the entire world's knowledge so i think that the fantastic point of time and, and more power to you and more power to uh women could you have i mean share some advices to i mean you know women entrepreneurs you know such as yourself who are coming into the uh in a silicon valley or anywhere around the world uh, who want to set up businesses or possibly uh, uh invest uh, vc firm what would be your advice? 
advice. Yeah. So before I um, answer your question, I also want to quickly comment what you mentioned early on in terms of now innovation could happen any, everywhere and also could empower so many people because it is true and we're very lucky. The trend of technology right now is the democratized technology. For example, for AI, we've been talking about the concept of a no-code AI platform, which means the user of the AI doesn't need to write a single line of code, doesn't need to understand the algorithm. But technology gonna become much easier for to access than people could build up different applications on top of that. Everyone have a great idea. Just think about, for example, before we have a camera, you have to paint very well, have certain skill in order to capture a beautiful image. But now if you have a perspective, you have an eye of identifying and capture a beautiful moment, you could use camera to it. You could become a photographer, also become an artist. So that's the power of one way lower the entry barrier for technology usage everyone be able to use this most effective tool technology is a tool to drive innovation to drive changes in industry in society in their personal life so that's a part super passion and i'm super passionate and also very exciting about and to come to your question about diversity inclusion especially for female entrepreneur first you know i always insist and I always highlight the reason why highlight diversity is never about just only social impact. Diversity is critical to innovation. Think about what does it mean for innovation? You need to bring new things to the existing industry. You need to bring in changes. If whoever is working on innovation all have the same background, investors all have the same background, how you bring new perspective, new things, new culture, new, uh, new things coming into the innovation, you couldn't. So diversity is critical to innovation. That's also the reason why for the past 40, 50 years, Silicon Valley has been the main engine to push at each single wave of innovation trend from semiconductor to the last wave of internet to now AI trend, right? And for another thing is diversity gonna drive much better investment results and also commercial performance. The company gonna do better, make better decisions. So coming from there, you know, I've been part of the lots of this other uh, diverse background, the founder investor group. We've been collecting data to show people the very solid data point to, to, to prove the result. Diversity is critical, is beneficial to business result. Gonna make you make more money, have more successful you know, product launch and be able to have better commercial commercialization. So for a female founder, for minority founder, I think I hope that message will give you lots of confidence when you launch something. We're now asking people, oh, this is something good you should do. No, that's a smart thing to do. That's the right thing to do, but also smart thing to do. If you're smart enough, you should consider back and support diverse and a diverse background founder because the business result is going to be better. Another thing in reality, yes, there's still lots of work need to be done. Lots of progress need to be made for this industry to evolve to the next stage uh, to be more, more welcoming and easy to adapt for the diverse and the minority background founder. But I think as long as we have more uh, driving power from the top, from the top, I mean, look, investor like us, more diverse background. Another thing is in the boardroom. That's also related to one of my another passion I've been working, spent some time on. I'm also a jury board member for Cardiac Women Initiative. I also work with the KP Goldman, some other large institute for the initiative focus on how to make women become the leader. Leader means more women in the boardroom. I have 14 board seats, 13 of them, I'm the only female board member in the room. But if you want to drive changes, we could do bottom up, but the probably more effective and efficient way is top down. So I think for the female leader in different industry, you should consider take the challenge to take a private board, private company board, or even public company board. Instead of being the rule breaker, we could also become rule maker. It's not only for female founder or female leader, it's for anyone, newcomer to the industry, minority founder, immigrant founder. Think about how to become the rule maker. Top down, we could drive changes in the industry. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about the portfolio companies? Yeah, you know, AI is such a hot buzzword, so I'd be happy to quickly share some portfolio company. Uh, you guys could give a try you could use for your day-to-day -day, uh, efficiency improvement, productivity improvement. The first one is Alter.ai, O-T-T-E-R.ai. It's been a pretty mature company already, have tons of tons of users. 
and is uh, the basically the best uh, live uh, transcript uh, AI power solution in the market. Any meeting you have, you could use it as your personal assist assistant, record a meeting, transcript using AI meeting summary. There's lots of functionality. So they've been adopted by tons of users and also lots of the large customer and uh, they're in Series B round C round already, pretty mature company and uh, super efficient in terms of such a small team generating so much revenue. So that's the first one. Second one, uh, U.com, Y-O-U.com. That's a company also everyone could give a try to use. They're the one of the best generative AI search engine. Founder of U.com, Richard, was the chief science officer of Salesforce. He personally also is a great contributor to the transformer model. And they have a, such a great integration of the technology, not only guarantee all the search results, are highly accurate, highly relevant, and also have you code, you write, you image, Basically, all the fabrication consolidated into one uh, product and very mature, have tons of users already launched since two years ago. We also invested roughly two years ago. And then the third one, I also want to highlight a, a AI healthcare company called Huma.ai. So they're mainly focused on life science and the pharmaceutical industry. And they retrain the model with the industry domain knowledge and the industry specific data set. So the use case could be very straightforward. And you ask the question, how to design a clinical trial for this new medication? The customer, including Pfizer and other artists, as in Zeneca, this top pharma company. Human could give you a super high, accurate, highly professional answer and the result. It's very different from your experience with ChatGPT, which lots of time it made up the answer and the accuracy is not guaranteed, but Human is able to provide industry high quality standard uh, search result and answers. So this is kind of the very quick evolving technology. They're all relative early stage company, but they're adopted by all this large corporate and the industry leader uh, already. So there are so many great things happening and you guys should definitely catch up. Would you like to highlight, you know, how AI is, is going to revolutionize healthcare? You know, this is my favorite topic. I've been investing in healthcare. I've been working on healthcare for more than a decade. And for healthcare, uh, first uh, AI would have the biggest opportunity in healthcare industry, not even one of, because healthcare in the United States, almost 20% of US GDP. If you really look at the quality and the quantity of the data in healthcare industry, it's incomparable with other industry because it's so much high quality data, easy to be labeled or already labeled, could be used to train the AI model to make it more efficient and effective. And if we look at specific vertical focus, there are so many things could be done better with AI. From the healthcare system, I would say that there's a triple A problem in healthcare system. Accessibility, of affordable, and accuracy. We could solve that problem with AI. And then come to clinical application. We could do better personalized diagnostic with AI. We call it digital diagnostic. Personalized therapeutic solution, we call it digital therapeutics. Combined together, we could call it digital medicine powered by AI. We also have digital biology. People all heard the amazing work done by the Alpha Fold last year. So digital biology gonna drive tons of changes in the near future. Digital life science. So when we combine the power of data and AI within healthcare, we could really achieve the goal that provide low cost, personalized healthcare services to each individual, fundamental improve the productivity and efficiency of the healthcare service provider and also really free up the capacity of hospital and also doctor, and eventually help us maintain a high quality of life. It's not just the live longer, but the live longer with much high quality of the life, high quality of the health. Could you share some AI applications which are being used at this point in time? Let's come out from some of your portfolio companies. Yes, yes, we have a company called the Mission Bio. They are in pretty late stage already. They're the leader in the single cell sequencing for cancer diagnostics. They also have a really robust data platform powered by AI, be able to provide the personalized early stage diagnostic result for different type of cancer and be able to recommend personalized therapeutic solution. And the really, you know, when we capture cancer super early on, the treatment could be much simpler and the less damaging to the body. We also have company, for example, Saddle Medical. What they're doing is medical image enhancement. You know, we all had experience go to the hospital to take a CT scan, MRI scan, and high resolution scan take hour long. 
But if you do low resolution scan, the resolution is not high enough. You don't have enough information. So what Sato Medical could do is you could just take a low resolution scan with a couple minutes and software will upgrade it to high resolution. So it's better, faster, cheaper, and the lower radiation. And for hospital, they also improve their capacity. They don't need to buy a new machine. They could handle more uh, patient per day. So they are covering so many different medical image devices already. And we also have a company called Prosia doing AI pathology and they really enable the doctor to improve their productivity, accuracy, and the efficiency. And they're also the number one in the industry right now. When would these applications be available, not just in America, but globally? You know, that's another thing I hope I could help drive in the future. I, of course, have a global perspective with my background. And the U.S. market is definitely the first and the most important market for all the startup company to grow to a certain stage. But the sooner or later, especially for AI healthcare company, there's a even bigger opportunity outside the United States. And also in terms of uh, benefit the whole world with the advanced development of the technology is also very important. It's just I think U.S. is still maintained as the best uh, initial market for any new things. And the once it's validated in U.S. market, it will be much easier to deploy to other market. But now the good thing is compared with the traditional healthcare solution, which is more device based, all small cell, all this complicated technology based. Now lots of the solutions are more like a digital platform play. So it's much easier for this type of solution to transfer, deploy in other market. Uh, so we're definitely looking forward to that happen. We have some company already go global. For example, company I mentioned, Asado Medical, because even this is the hospital in India, a hospital in the United States, essentially they're buying the CT scan machine or MR machine from the same medical device company. So for them, it's very easy to go different countries. So they're in Europe already. They're also thinking about Asia in the future. As the founder and managing partner of Fusion Fund, you invest in early stage uh, startups across a variety of industry. What do you look for in the startup when deciding whether to invest or not? Some people misunderstood that early stage investment could be quite easy. Actually, it's quite complicated and very hard. Essentially, we have to make decisions based on incomplete information. We couldn't figure out every single thing because lots of things are uncertain and the thing may change in the future. So we have to do more comprehensive due diligence. We evaluate company from all different dimensions, from market, market size, market timing, technology. Technology has to be better, faster, cheaper. Not only just the best, has to be better, faster, cheaper. The team, team background, execution, relevant experience, execution, go-to-market strategy, competitive landscape. Last is exit analysis, thinking about what is the potential exit for the company. So there are so many things we need to consider and we need to do due diligence and look at the company. If you ask me a couple of things I really look for, look for from uh, talking to a founder, I think a great founder first has to have a big vision and a clear vision, really know what he or she wanted to do. That's really important. Only if you are so determined as to strong conviction with your vision will be able to attract the top talents, which comes to the second thing, has to have strong leadership. One simple validation of leadership is was able to attract the best talents to join in the company. And the third is really resilient. You know, for this journey as an entrepreneur, it's never about, you know, going up the smartest people, smartest people going to win. No, company going to go through a cycle. Sometimes it's a microeconomy cycle. Sometimes it's just company operation and development cycle. The founder who have a strong, uh, capability, strong resilient, uh, resilient uh, capability, and also really be able to go through different cycle and be able to be the survivor, then be the ultimate winner. So that's really one important thing we're looking at. The last thing is unique insight about industry. Whether you have a unique take and unique insight about the industry you're focusing on, that will build up your fundamental, unfair, or unique differentiation and make you stand out from other competitors. Right. Uh, what are your views on India as a market opportunity and is Fusion Fund looking to invest in startups from India? I have to admit I'm very far into Indian market. I've never been to Indian, but I definitely invest a lot of Indian founder in Silicon Valley already. And we have a we had a great experience working with lots of Indian founders in Silicon Valley. I definitely heard from them about the market and also their take on the talent pool there. Uh, my impression has been tons of talents in Indian and also it's a big market with very young population. But that feels like for now, uh, still need to see whether there's a very mature business ecosystem. 
for a smaller startup to grow up. Definitely, there's lots of great company being established in India already. We may consider in the future, we didn't have near-term plan to like look at Indian as a market, but uh, on the other side, we're going to continue to work closely with lots of Indian immigrant founders focused on U.S. market. So what do you think are some of the biggest trends and opportunities in technology right now, and how can entrepreneurs uh, leverage them? Yes, uh, so the sector I'm focusing on are the major trend we believe in. Healthcare in general, huge market. Second is enterprise AI, enterprise network. Last is industry automation, vertical AI focused on traditional sector. I think this trend of AI is going to be probably at least the 10x bigger than internet. Internet is more about technology industry, but this time traditional sector, financial insurance, logistics, manufacturing, chemical industry, all this traditional industry are integrated with AI to leverage their data asset. So think about how big the opportunity could be. But for founder, I need to think it through which type of uh, application you want to build and which industry you want to focus. Because access to the data, unique data library, going to be the key differentiation, not a model. And another thing is really understand the ecosystem and be able to grow very quickly together with the ecosystem while this industry adopting new technology. Today, the consumers are king and they're being spoiled for choice with these freemium models by entrepreneurs who, who want to uh, acquire uh, consumers. And, and generative AI is allowing any and every everybody to kind of design, create, even code and build th things very uh, easily. So with this uh, democratization, accessibility of tech, what's happening is that the monetization is becoming harder. Is this trend uh, you, you're seeing where the access, accessibility and democratization of technology making things uh, difficult for entrepreneurs to monetize? Not really. I think it depends on which type of innovation you're referring to. Consumer, maybe, because also probably there will be more beneficial business model situation for larger players. They also have access to majority of the consumer data. But for us, we don't touch consumer. We focus on enterprise application. The opportunity we saw is all this large corporate, they're enable their CTO with a bunch of the budget, over a billion dollar budget. They're, they're ready to deploy. They're, they're ready to pay. They're ready to acquire technology solution. And meanwhile, on the other side, maybe a consumer application is much easier to build. You could call the API, write something, quickly build a small application. But that thing could be done by Google, by Facebook, lots of other this big consumer company. But for industry application, Gen AI powered solution, you have to retrain the model with industry data and also use your domain knowledge to give feedback to the process of training. So that actually create a bar for a founder to be able to build a solid solution focused on each industry. And which also eventually gonna give them the niche to build up such a nice monetization process and be able to get a lot of revenue from their customer. How is the VC industry being affected by the global uh, downturn? <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting uh, question because uh, people know there's the tons of dry powder in VC, but uh, the activity has not been that active uh, since last year. I think main reason is late stage VC billion dollar firm have some unique situation that there are lots of downrun happening in the late stage. There are uh, much less candidate for them to consider investing at a late stage. But if you look at early stage, still quite active. Early stage, we probably have going to have the best vintage year last year and this year. Uh, we see so many great companies came out and high quality founder. You know, last year, this year, I did uh, in total like 17 companies. More than 60% of the founder are repeating successful founder. Serial entrepreneur who had financial freedom already. They're launching a new company because they also think market time is good. So we see industry, I would say average, most of founders may have a hard time to raise money. Most of VC may not be that active in investing, but good companies still got oversubscribed round. It will be like more polarized situation. Top company got oversubscribed and concentrated resources and capital, and the rest have a harder time to raise money. So I yeah. hope the market momentum could be better later this year. And also all this dry powder could start to deploy and come to the market. Right. What, what, what comes next to you and what's your moonshot? Moonshot, I think if uh, beyond what I already mentioned about all this like a different uh, technology innovation, within healthcare, I'm really bullish about digital biology. Digital biology is not only for healthcare industry, it's also for food industry, for uh, chemical industry. Think about what we can do with a synthetic bio 
now the process could be much cheaper and much more efficient. We could grow small meat cell to a piece of meat. We could replace lots of enzyme in the chemical industry with this much simpler and environmental friendly process. So digital biology is gonna be a really, really big uh, trend uh, in the next couple of years. Another thing is, I think uh, while we're deploying AI, data privacy is going to be a key challenge, key issue, and also big opportunity. That's another thing I'm really looking forward to. And one last thing is, now the biggest challenge, one of the major challenges for using large language model is really the computing consumption. We joke about everyone work for NVIDIA now because the con computing consumption is so high, so expensive. There'll be lots of great technology to be able to reduce that in the near future. Really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Wish you and the team the very best. You are an inspiration because you, you have proven that anyone uh, from anywhere in the world, if he's got the will, desire and intent, can create out, uh, uh, make a great life for him, himself or herself. So uh, keep on doing what you're doing. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you.